in supply chains we're often focused on managing both the supply side and the demand side but we've talked a lot about looking at the supply side of the supply chain however the demand side of the supply chain is just as important and so one of the ways of actually managing or influencing the demand side is our pricing strategies. This particular chapter will look at uh, the issue of pricing in the supply chain and how it um, uh, impacts the opportunities that exist in managing the supply chain. So far, according to what we've covered in the text, there seem to be this uh, notion that we cannot influence the demand side, but however, that is possible and we'll explore a number of strategies for actually doing that. I mean, a typical example uh, is a company or a group of companies offering um, price promotions, actually doing some uh, major advertising, and of course changing their different prices, or changing their prices at different times to influence uh, the demand. Uh, Dell, for example, um, have a pricing strategy where it prices depending on its customers and then the product price could actually vary over time and also the options that one offers and the prices for those options can also vary over time so you could, there are a number of things that you could actually do in terms of um, manipulating the pricing strategy so, as to, so that you could actually influence uh, the demand for product there are some other examples um, that are covered in our, ch in our, in our text. IBM, and of course, <laughs> these, these examples have been done already. They're, they're old. However, at least we get a sense of what these companies were attempting to do. So IBM, for example, was looking at uh, implementing some sort of software that would adjust prices depending on the demand uh, for its products and so forth. So if there's a lot of demand, then you could raise the prices because it helps to increase your revenues. If there's insufficient demand, then you could try to increase the demand by lowering your prices. So I guess some kind of mechanism for sensing the demand um, is often very helpful. Nikon um, sold this camera, a Coolpix uh, digital camera, for $600 and um, it provided a rebate. So what happened, of course, the rebate influences demand because if people feel that they're going to get $100 off, then there's, they're more likely to actually purchase the item, right? Um, Boy's Cascade Office product sells many products online and the prices for uh, the 12,000 items will change as often as daily. So again, experimenting with prices uh, to try to influence the demand, but also optimize the revenues as well. So we often want to know why these companies are actually doing price manipulations and then whether or not the, strat the general strategies that are used can be used across a number of different industries. Okay. And why can't companies just simply stick with a single fixed price? Why is there the need to sort of be adjusting prices over time? So these are some questions that um, we could raise in the context of managing the supply chain. One thing we know for sure is that there are environments where influencing the prices or, 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 or developing a pricing strategy has major implications for revenues. And the reason why it has major implications for revenues is because it has major implications for demand. And that demand ultimately has to be met by the supply chain. So let's talk a little bit about revenue management and its principles because this is a very important uh, strategy that is being used in a number of industries, the airline industry, the hotel industry, car rental industry, and so forth. So let's try to get a sense of that. <coughs> So essentially what we see is that companies are trying to boost their profit by manipulating prices or, or by smart pricing. The word manipulation seems to suggest they're doing something wrong it's just by adjusting and managing the prices in such a way to maximize their revenues. 
American Airlines sort of pioneered that when it was about to receive some competition for People Express. It had to look for ways to optimize its revenue. And, um, and by sort of doing smart pricing, it was able to successfully defend its market from People Express. Right? Um, one thing that happened was that it uh, clearly maximized its revenues and the incremental revenue that it was able to generate was over a billion dollars. Now we know American Airlines is still having major problems uh, as, as an organization, as a business. And, and that's largely because by now a lot of other companies have actually caught up with the technology. So while they may have gained some competitive advantage in the past, um, revenue management strategies is certainly not putting them ahead of the competition like it did. Um, so let's examine the relationship between price and demand. So all things being equal, a demand for a product will typically uh, go down when the price increases and vice versa. The, the demand will actually increase when the price goes down. Um, we have situations where um, certain products are more or less sensitive to uh, price changes and the curve, the demand price, the price demand curve is generally a downward sloping curve. And what we mean by that is that there is this sort of a negative slope uh, to this demand curve, right? So the questions that managers would ask is, uh, what is the optimal price at which revenue is maximized? And that is not a trivial question. One has to um, do some analysis to be able to answer that question. And to be able to do so, we need to be able to characterize um, the relationship between price and demand. So one has to kind of know that, what is that function? And then use that characterization, use that function to optimize the price for each individual product. And if you have several different products, um, you can see this could become a very monumental task to try to optimize prices for each different product. But I guess a company would then decide on a subset of its products to actually explore the use of revenue management strategies. So if you kind of use the same, uh, the concept of ABC analysis where your A items are your most important items, then you could certainly um, group those items and apply the strategies to it. The other thing too is that there are some conditions under which um, revenue management strategies work well and so not, so not all the products that a firm actually sells will necessarily be appropriate for revenue management uh, strategies, all right? So here's an example uh, just to sort of demonstrate this concept where demand is a function of the price. So demand is 1,000 minus 0.5 times the price. And we could actually compute when the price is set to different values what the demand is. So in the case of the price being $1,600, the demand is 200 And as you can see here, if the price is 1200 which is cheaper, the demand actually goes up to 400 So you could actually take that revenue cost curve and uh, optimize it. You could do it for calculus. Um, you know that if we, so if we take the demand function and we multiply it by P the price, you get the revenue. And then, so the revenue would then be 1,000 times P minus 0.5 P squared. So it's a quadratic function. And you could optimize that quadratic function by uh, doing differential calculus. But you could do it empirically by just trying a number of different prices and seeing what happens. And according to this curve, the price is optimized, um, the uh, revenues is actually optimized when the price is set to $1,000 according to this particular curve. And this is kind of what it looks like. So here's our demand curve. If we set the price, the demand is 500 units and then the revenue is $500,000 in this case. Now, a <coughs> uh, pricing strategy that companies use um, is markdowns. A markdowns, uh, towards the end of a season typically, a company would um, take its uh, original price and mark it down by 10, 15, 20 percent because it's trying to sell off items at the end of the season. Um, 
you would have had inventory uh, sitting in a warehouse. And if in the next cycle, the next season, those products are going to become more or less obsolete, you want to get rid of it. So in a case like that, demand is typically random. At the end of a selling season, there may be remaining inventory and firms frequently employ a markdown or sale to dispose of that excess inventory, all right? So what happens is that each, uh, if you think of it from the perspective of the customer, the customer has a price that they would pay. And um, what happens is that they have some folks who are willing to pay that price during the season. Some other people are watching the product saying, wow, this is great, but I, I, I don't want to pay that price for it. So at the end of the season, when the price drops down, you might very well reach what we call their reservation price. And they would then in turn turn around and purchase the item. All right. So just to kind of give you a sense of that markdown concept, when the price is $1,200, the demand is 400 So 400 customers have a reservation price at or above $1,200. So when that price is uh, below the reservation price, they will actually buy, all right? So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the lower the price, the more customers with a reservation price above or below that will actually purchase. So if, if my reservation price is 1200 or 1300 or 1400 if you drop the price below 1200 certainly I buy the product. So, however, there are some people whose reservation price is below the 1200 That's why you drop it. So not only do you uh, include in your demand pool the people whose reservation price is 1200 or higher, you're now including those folks whose reservation price were also a bit lower. So when you sell a product to customers whose reservation price will be below the original price but above the sale price, then you actually can increase your revenues that way. So there's a, cre there's a reason why people try to avoid markdowns, of course, because it may uh, sort of show that inventory was not managed properly, that products perhaps were not priced appropriately, or that there were, there were, there were some sort of weakness in the marketing strategy. And, um, and not only that, too, I mean, you don't want people just sort of scavenging, just waiting for you to drop your prices um, to, to purchase your product. Because the people who are paid at a higher price will then be sharing um, the items with people who paid less. But then again, they may not know that those folks actually paid less money for the items. Right? But in some cases, it's necessary to have markdowns to get rid of excess inventory. Price differentiation, um, this concept has to do with the fact that you have different customers are willing to pay different prices, okay? Um, so in fashion, for example, you have some people who would say, you know, I'm not going to wait till the markdowns, I'm going to actually purchase the product as soon as it comes out. I mean, let's just face it, uh, there's some of us who are waiting for an iPhone to drop in its price when the next model is about to come. Um, compared to the folks who are lining up when the product is actually announced. So you do have, and of course, uh, something like an iPhone is a fashion product, really. So in fashion, some customers are very fashion conscious. They want to buy at the start of the selling season and will pay more. Other customers are value conscious and they'll be willing to wait till the end of the sales season and are not willing to pay the high prices at the beginning of that season. So different uh, customers can be charged different prices. So what, what is very clear is that it's necessary to understand the customers and their price sensitivity and then you price appropriately. So according to the, the demand curve, um, so the retailers will charge many customers who are willing to pay a, a higher price of $1,000. But then you have 200 customers who are willing to pay $1,600. That's, that's really from the, from the demand curve that we just saw earlier. About 100 customers who are willing to pay $1,800. So if you think about this, you have 400 customers, um, I think it was 500 customers who are willing to pay 1000 
200 who are willing to pay 1600 and 100 who are willing to pay 1800 so <clears throat> how can you capture those these um, uh, different customer segments it's uh, important to find a strategy to be able to do that if you just charge a single price then all those people who are willing to pay higher you're not capturing that revenue from them so there's a need for a, a different approach a different strategy and you could actually calculate how much money you leave on the table so yeah <clears throat> excuse me you could look at the price that people are willing to pay um, f you know in terms of the so the, the number of people willing to pay different prices and you could actually compute what you are leaving on the table by using a single fixed price as opposed to using differential prices all right let's just look at this example right here that kind of demonstrates um, so if if um, we look at the difference between a thousand and two thousand um, the total amount of money actually left on the table turns out to be two hundred fifty thousand dollars there is a the revenue function uh, would have to be determined for that and that can be assess uh, quite easily. Let's look at a, a case where we have a two price strategy just to show that you could actually do better than a single price strategy. So if we set a price at sixteen hundred and one thousand at sixteen hundred dollars the demand is two hundred items. At one thousand is five hundred. So what happens is that we set the price at sixteen hundred and you'll get the 200 customers you'll get the 200 customers purchasing and the balance of the 500 which is 300 customers will then purchase at the lower price of 1000 all right and when you add that up together you get a total value of six hundred twenty thousand dollars in revenues this is more than the five hundred thousand if we just simply set the price at one thousand dollars so you make $120,000 more than a single tier strategy. You could actually go to a three tier strategy where you could set 1800, 1600 and 1000. And if the demand at 1800 is 100, the demand at 1600 is 200, then what happens is that our revenue is calculated as follows. So we could sell uh, 100 items at $1800. And then you have the difference between the 200 people who were willing to buy at 1600 and above, less than 100 who are paying $1,800. So you have an extra 100 people who will purchase at $1,600. And then you now have to account for the 200 people who are purchasing at these higher prices. So 500 minus 200 gives you 300 people would then pay at $1,000. That gives us six hundred and forty thousand dollars, which actually is twenty thousand dollars more than the two-tier strategy. So you could see that by creating different prices and targeting those customers who are willing to pay different prices, you certainly can increase your revenue. Now, the question, a logical question to ask, is why would, if there's a price of one thousand dollars available, why would anybody want to pay eighteen hundred dollars? And that's because when you offer the price of eighteen hundred dollars you have to offer something more than just the basic product um, there has to be something that differentiates those markets and it could be extra services so for example the person who pays the eighteen hundred dollar price um, will get some additional service support the folks who pay one thousand dollars do not get any service support I mean there's a there's an example of that when students purchase software versus when companies purchase software we could purchase the same software, the same functionality, but then you get zero support um, in the in the student with the student version. But then, if you purchase an enterprise version, then you get full enterprise support. Um, and of course, companies would be willing to pay for that compared to a student who would not be willing to pay that higher price. So that happens in that environment. So here's how we sort of look at our free tier strategy. So. In essence, if you think of the area of the triangle as the revenues that you could actually um, obtain, then what you're really trying to do is to capture as much of that as possible. 
when we just had this um, single price of one thousand dollars there was all this area right here that was unoccupied and all this area right here but now what we've done is by creating these different prices right here we're able to use up some of that area this this chunk of it right here we're able to use up more of that and therefore that means you get more revenue so you could ask yourself you could say well can we create more of those things certainly we can but then if you have too many different prices you start to confuse customers so it doesn't make sense to simply just try to create as you know 10 different prices for an item because then you have to ha find a way to separate or segregate your customers into 10 different categories and that may not necessarily be uh, feasible okay so revenue management let's just expand on this concept a bit more uh, it's selling the right inventory unit to the right type of customer at the right time for the right price that's essentially what we're getting into so it integrates pricing and inventory strategies to influence market demand provides controls for companies to improve the bottom line uh, and so it's really all about trying to find strategies uh, that maximizes the knowledge you gain from understanding your customers and then using that to increase profits or revenues and that area uh, a number of companies uh, it do invest significantly in gathering data and intelligence about its markets um, the airline industries uh, insurance industries certainly hotel industries car rental industries and so on um, so essentially there's a set of common characteristics that those companies have that allow them to use revenue management strategies. Some of the characteristics include the fact that you have a perishable product. The item, the inventory item cannot be carried from period to period. So for example, um, if you think about say hotel rooms, a, a room night not sold today is not going to be um, cannot be sold tomorrow right so that inventory is perishable you have fluctuating demand the demand for rooms vary over time you have a fixed capacity your hotel only has a thousand um, a hemi a um, hundred rooms sorry or uh, 200 rooms <coughs> segmentation of the market uh, is based on price sensitivity or the um, service time the duration of service and products can be sold in advance. And when we say the duration of service, we're talking about, for example, if you think of a flight, a three-hour flight versus a five-hour flight. Um, sometimes you could get cheaper flights, but then you may have to take two stops or three stops. Um, and some people actually care about that. They'll be willing to pay a higher price for a direct flight um, versus uh, uh, an indirect flight, in which case you might be able to get a slightly cheaper flight. So revenue management was pioneered by American Airlines we talked about in the 80s. Um, it was a counter strategy to People Express. The techniques uh, employed uh, was essentially differentiated pricing. It was very successful, which led to the demise of People Express. And then, of course, once that was seen, other airlines started to actually copy that, the hotel industry, car rental industry, and so on. So if you think about customer segments in the airline industry, because we say that is important, you must be able to segment your customers, then you have leisure travelers and business travelers. Leisure travelers are highly sensitive to price, business travelers are not sensitive to price. But uh, leisure travelers are generally not sensitive to the duration. They'll, <laughs> they'll take a six hour flight uh, for what can typically be a two hour flight. Um, if they get it at a very cheap price. But business travelers usually are very, very sensitive to trip duration. So they want direct flights, they're willing to pay more. Uh, and so you have two different customer classes right there. Okay? And if we look at uh, this sort of two dimensional uh, matrix that looks at sensitivity to duration or flexibility versus sensitivity to price. If we have customers who are, have low sensitivity to duration or flexibility, they really don't care, and um, low sensitivity to price, 
they wanted to pay just about anything, then you won't get any demand there. You, you know, it's, it's very difficult to find someone who's not sensitive to price and not sensitive to duration. I mean, who would want to pay, you know, double a, you know, <clears throat> an airfare if the time it takes you to get to your destination is twice or three times as long as a direct flight? I mean, you know, see, you, they, they are trade-offs, clearly. If um, you have customers that have high sensitivity to price and high sensitivity to duration, then you make no offer in that category. But if you have those who are highly sensitive to price, low sensitivity to duration, that's your leisure travelers, and then, of course, low sensitivity to price, but high sensitivity to duration, that's your business travelers right here. So just kind of helps us to understand those. So a question I sort of raised earlier is that when you now have different prices for different customer segments, how do you prevent customers from migrating across the different segments? I mean, because just, be, you know, just because I'm willing to pay $1,200 for a ticket, if it's available at $600, if, if that's available simultaneously, I'll buy the $600 price. I mean, so, I, so it means that you have to create some barriers between those different prices, and we call those fences. And so, fences limit the movement across the different price groups. So, if you buy a Tango ticket uh, on Air Canada, then usually it's non-refundable, right? You can, um, if you want to make any changes, you're going to have to pay uh, a significant penalty and so forth. But if you were to buy a leisure fare, then you could change it any time you want, and that price is actually usually twice or more than twice the price of a tango fare. So if I want the flexibility, in this case I'm sensitive to flexibility, I'm willing to pay the higher price. The um, uh, tango or traveler is not that sensitive to flexibility. They don't really care that much. And so therefore they would be, they would be willing to buy the lower price since they don't need that flexibility. All right? So market segmentation is extremely important uh, in, that, in that environment if we're looking at the airline industry and of course booking control. Uh, so sometimes to get certain fares, uh, if you want the cheap fares, you need to book way in advance. Um, so as you could see, let's look at the market segmentation part for specific flight and time, origin to destination. So basically you could segment your market using these parameters. Different products designed and priced to target different market segments. Product features include different restrictions, non-refundable, available up to 21 days before the flight, etc., etc., etc. And the booking control allocates uh, seats to fair classes, um, set limits on the number of seats that can be allocated to a lower fair class. So in terms of business um, class tickets, uh, what you have uh, is, uh, if I use the Air Canada example, is that you have two fair classes, one that they call full executive and the other that is called executive lowest. And so in that case, there's a need to make a decision in terms of how many seats, if there are nine seats in executive class or 12 seats, how many will you allocate to full executive versus executive lowest? And that allocation could change over time as you get closer and closer to the flight time. The, in the economy section now, this is where you get your Tango, you get your Flex, you get your Leisure. So that's three fair classes that Air Canada, for example, uses. And all those seats are in economy. So there, a certain number of seats have to be allocated to each of these classes. And over time, as you get closer, depending on the inventory that's left, the prices can change or the amount of seats allocated to each um, fair class could actually ch change. It's possible to see that no Tango seats are available uh, maybe two weeks before a flight because the amount of seats allocated um, you know, essentially have been exhausted but as you get closer to the flight some more seats have, be have become available at the Tango fair because they're trying to sell it off. All right. Optimal allocation of flights, so this is just an example to show um, what can happen when you get into 
the analysis of how to allocate between flights. So we have a leisure fare of $100 per ticket, a business fare of $250 per ticket, 80 seats on a plane. Company can sell as many seats as they want to make available at the leisure fare. So in other words, the demand is there. The business fare is a, a bit more random. And here is where we have what we call a demand distribution for the business fares. So we could actually calculate what we call the expected revenues. That is, uh, if we were to sell uh, five seats, and what's the, the chance of selling five seats, what's the chance of selling 10, 15, and so forth. If we use that demand distribution, we could calculate what we call the marginal revenues of the two classes. In other words, if you sell a certain number of business class seats, then the balance is sold in, in, in the economy fair, right? So if, if we sold 10 business class seats, then we have 80 uh, seats that are, not 80 seats, I think the total number of seats were 80, 70 that are sold in economy, 20, then we have um, 50 and so on, or 60, I believe it is, sorry, total of 80 seats. So we could actually calculate what we call a, the marginal revenue curve based on what we sell in terms of the number of business class seats. And we try to find the optimum point where your marginal revenues that you get from your leisure and your marginal revenues from your business class are actually equal. And they converge at this point right here. So this point becomes your optimum point, which is approximately 18 seats at business class. So if you sell 18 seats at business class, that maximizes the total revenue uh, for that particular flight. All right. So the approach is essentially to determine the expected revenue for each number of allocated seats, determine the expected marginal revenue for business class, and um, the revenue associated with allocating one additional seat can be calculated. This decreases as the number of al seats allocated increases. So marginal revenue associated with leisure class seats, unlimited demand is available. So it, apply, it implies that the revenue, sorry, that the marginal revenue is constant. In other words, the value that you get from one selling one additional economy class seat is the same. That doesn't change. So the curve that we just looked at a while ago optimizes for us the marginal revenue, sorry, the overall revenue, but it, it optimizes that decision at a point where the marginal revenue for the business class becomes equal to the marginal revenue for the economy class, okay? So there are some complexities uh, in terms of that industry. One is that you have different flight classes that we talked about earlier, your tango, your flex, your leisure, etc. Um, the hierarchies of the classes. Then you have the demand information um, can be quite complex. Uh, trying to analyze uh, demand for flights is not a simple matter. And then the network management, and the network management we're talking about sort of the origin destination combinations that are available. How, if a company is using hub and spoke uh, as one um, network configuration, airlines like Southwest Airlines use point to point, that's a different configuration. And so that has to be accounted for when you're thinking about your, your, your analysis, has to take that into consideration. And then, of course, the prices change over time. Um, so during a season, a holiday season, the prices get jacked up. During the low season, the prices uh, could be a lot less. And not only that, towards as we get closer to the flight, if the, if the plane is not filling up, then the airline might decide to increase the um, seats available at the lower fares to try to fill that up, all right? as you mentioned earlier. So smart pricing, American Airlines success prompted other industries to adopt similar practices. 
specific techniques and tools of airline revenue management don't necessarily apply to all industries. As I mentioned, that there are some characteristics that are important uh, for that to work. And then, uh, but however, some of the general underlying principles, for example, the fact that if um, you vary the prices over time, you can influence the demand, those things apply across industries. And we just have to find the right combination. So the two approaches to smart pricing, differential pricing and dynamic pricing. Differential pricing says charge different people different things. Dynamic pricing says change your prices over time. It could be that you have a single class of customers, but over time you're monitoring the response to your price and then you're varying that, particularly if your inventory is perishable, then as you get closer to the data perishability, you certainly want to consider changing your prices. So prices will change over time. Differential prices, as I've already mentioned, is just about charging different customers different prices. And Dell, for example, would have a different set of prices for his business customers because he's offering them services compared to consumers. All right? And with differential pricing strategies, you could, you could talk about group pricing where you offer special prices to different groups of people. So if you are a member of an association, sometimes you get uh, different prices. If you're a senior citizen, you get different prices. If you're a government worker, in fact, if you look at the hotels, they give you, you see different prices based on whether or not you are a CAA or AAA member. If you are a senior, if you're a government employee, and so often, you know, I would ask for um, a government um, thing. Uh, you know, government government price, because uh, Saint Mary's University is considered a government institution. Channel pricing depend on where you purchase. If you purchase online versus if you purchase in store, that could be different. And regional pricing, you would pay differently for the product in Halifax compared to Sydney, or uh, just just pay different uh, even within the within the city. You buy a beer at a stadium versus buying a beer at a bar, versus buying a beer at a hotel, then you have different prices that changes, all right? Um, you could also have time-based differentiation, where the products are differentiated based on time. So Amazon, for example, will charge you different prices if you want a two-day delivery versus if you want three-day delivery, four-day delivery, um, or sorry, or two-week delivery and so forth. A product versioning, which has to do with slightly offering slightly different variations or configurations of a product, and you could um, charge differently. So, uh, store brand versus a generic brand, in a case like that, you could have different prices. In terms of uh, differential pricing strategies as well, you could look at coupons versus rebates, um, where customers get uh, a coupon. Uh, for a discount, or they get a rebate, and sometimes sometimes the, the rebates are instant. That is, it's given to you at a point of sale. In some cases, you actually need to mail them in, and mailing rebates are uh, quite interesting because most people either lose them or don't take the time to mail in the rebates. The fact that you could get a discount influences your decision, but you may very well not follow through with actually getting the rebate because it requires too much work. So with rebates, we have um, a situation where you could either have no rebates or you could have mailing rebates. And that influences uh, the supply chain in, in, in various ways. So with no rebate, you have uh, each retailer will decide on the price and the amount to order from the manufacturer to maximize its profit. So the retailer needs to find a price and an order quantity so as to maximize its, its uh, expected profit. Right? The manufacturer would like the retailer to order as much as possible at the wholesale price. So in a case like that, if you offer no rebate, you have these two individuals simply um, trying to decide what is best. The manufacturer wants the retailer to order as much as possible. The retailer says, well, we're not offering any rebates. I have to find the optimum order quantity uh, that actually maximizes my profit. However, if... Um, you offer mailing rebates, the manufacturer is influencing the customer who believes that they'll be getting a discount. 
So in that case, if it influences the demand, the retailer will likely actually increase their orders. And in increasing their orders, then they could get, the manufacturer gets what they want, which is larger orders at the, at the wholesale price. All right? So it provides an upside incentive to the retailer to increase its order quantity. Retailer's profit can increase because customers actually purchase and um, the demand has gone up and um, the manufacturer also benefits uh, in that regard. So there's a question of why not just offer a discount to begin with and, and of course you know uh, if you offer a discount to begin with it is not necessarily the best situation but if you offer the rebate you get the effect of offering a discount but only a certain percentage of customers actually follow through with the mailing rebate. And that's why manufacturers will offer a rebate as opposed to an actual discounted price from the start. Dynamic pricing attempts to price a product over time and typically is done at the end of a season to try to get rid of excess inventories. Um, but also manufacturers can sort of look at adjusting their prices during the season um, to kind of influence the demand behavior or the purchasing behavior of customers. So if we have a sense of, uh, you know, we have what we call high reservation price customers or low reservation price customers. Uh, somewhere if you could manipulate the price between those two extremes you might actually be able to capture a few more customers um, whose reservation price is actually slightly below what the current asking price of the product is. So essentially you, you're just using pricing to influence demand. All right. So dynamic pricing, uh, is it better than a fixed price strategy? Now we know that um, Walmart practices everyday low prices, so they use a fixed price strategy. But um, it's not uncommon, or it's actually very common, for other companies to be using sort of a dynamic pricing strategy. And it's possible to increase profit to the 6% uh, when you do that. So you tend to get that it in sort of what we call low margin industries, retail industries, computer industries, and so on where people play around with prices to try to influence the demand. Uh, because you just cannot afford to have inventory sitting on the shelf uh, for way too long. The way Walmart makes its money though is not by uh, price promotions which drive demand, but rather by trying to lower its cost. Because if you think of the profitability function, profit is sales minus cost. You could try to drive sales for the same cost structure or you have a predictable cost um, sales pattern, but then you try to drive the cost down so that you could increase the profit. So we do have some conditions under which dynamic pricing can be superior to a fixed price strategy. One is that um, the capacity that you have, if you have smaller production capacity relative to your average demands. So when you, you, what you're always trying to do is to maximize the utilization of that capacity. There's a pretty good chance that as you vary your prices, because your capacity is smaller than the average demand, then there's a pretty good chance that you could change your price and still have sufficient demand to utilize all of your capacity. <coughs> demand variability. Um, if you have a fair amount of uh, variation in demand, then certainly dynamic pricing could help to manipulate the or shape the demand for your product. So the benefit of uh, dynamic pricing increases as the demand, the degree of demand uncertainty increases, and that sort of makes sense because if um, if there's no uncertainty in demand, then no matter what you do with your prices, you really can't change the demand pattern. But if there's variability in demand then your prices can help to shape what the actual the actual realized demand. Seasonality in the demand pattern, of course, um, if, if you have seasonal um, 
if you, if you have the potential for seasonality, that influences the opportunity uh, that dynamic pricing can provide. So, for example, if you think of movie theaters offering uh, cheap prices on Tuesday nights and so on. So that, that, has, that creates a seasonal pattern. Towards the weekend, for example, a lot of people go to the movies so they could sort of increase their prices as well. Um, in the low periods, you certainly could drop your pricing to try to increase the demand. And the length of the planning horizon, the longer the planning horizon, the smaller the benefit from dynamic pricing. So you typically try to uh, achieve benefits over a very short period in, in doing so. All right. The, what is the impact of the internet? The internet, as we know, have revolutionized um, our business transactions and so forth. So what benefit does the internet actually provide? Well, part of it has to do with the fact that the internet can present data very quickly. The internet can provide information on the demand or, or customer searches. If uh, people are coming to your website and examining certain products, you get a sense of uh, the level of interest in those products and what the demand is. If, if a particular product is never looked at by customers online, then you could sort of use that as an indicator that there might be little interest in that product, so you may need to change the price of it and so forth. You could also uh, offer a menu of costs, costs that uh, retailers incur, um, <coughs> sorry, menu costs, that is um, retailers will incur costs when they keep changing their posted uh, prices and so on. Uh, on the internet, the cost of changing that is, is quite low because all you got to do is change that and then sort of change your prices and put it back on uh, and post it back onto the web. So updating prices can be done on a daily basis, but just imagine if you want to change prices in a, in, a, in, a super, in, in a supermarket on a daily basis, that requires a fair amount of um, labor to go about changing the prices of these items because you have to go to look at each individual item and change the posted price on that. It's a lot of work. Um, it's low, low buyer search price. so. The cost that buyers incur when looking for a product, uh, and so the internet makes it very easy for you to figure out what's the price of that uh, from multiple suppliers, and as a result of that, you do have greater competition um, in online sales because uh, it's the prices of competitors are quite visible and, and quite easy to find out. So you could you could look up what Dell's price for a computer is, what Apple's price for a computer is. Um, what HP's price for a computer is, or printer, or cameras, Canon versus uh, Nikon versus um, Sony. It's very easy to find out what the prices are for similar DSLRs and so forth. So the internet really um, makes it easy for us to change our prices and then also easy for us to compare prices uh, as a result of that. Also, the internet um, visibility. So it makes it possible to coordinate your pricing with your inventory levels. So based on what you have in inventory, you might decide we have a fair amount of stock, let us um, lower our prices so that we can move some of that stock. And that information can be transferred very quickly. We could see what's left in stock, and when there are a few items left in stock, you could certainly change your prices and so forth to influence the demand. Uh, just the fact that you have availability of information, it makes it a lot easier for you to play around with prices, right? And when you look at um, customers' uh, historical data, it allows you to figure out um, some attributes of your customers based on what they buy. And so the internet um, provides opportunities for a company to actually learn more about its customers and use that information to be able to segment its uh, customers. And then, of course, you could always sort of pilot um, things on the internet a lot easier than you can in a, in a physical store. So if you want to change the price and see how people respond to it, you could change the prices online, particularly if you have a fairly large online market. Um, you could test higher prices on a small group of um, site visitors to see how they respond to it. And then that data can be used to determine or finalize your sort of your pricing strategy. All right? <coughs> There's some caveats. One is that you must avoid the appearance of unfair treatment of customers. So as you are doing smart pricing, it must be done in a manner that 
demonstrate some fairness, all right? And then um, it's also important to uh, keep in mind that um, while online sites uh, can provide some opportunities, uh, so for example, like your hotwire.com that provides outlets for, for last minute hotel rooms or, or, or flights and so on, that the, the fares are opaque. And because those fares are opaque, if those opaque fares are not lower than published fares from these uh, companies, then these sites will not necessarily provide much advantage at all. And so it's harder to attract customers to Priceline or Hotwire sites if the opaque fares are similar to your published fares. So you have to offer some opportunities um, or better fares online to draw customers uh, to purchase for that particular channel. Okay. In summary, pricing and promotion can be used to influence the level of demand. And um, so while we are aware that we could do a number of initiatives on the supply side of the supply chain, the demand side of the supply chain is also just as important. And pricing plays a significant role in influencing that demand. Uh, traditionally, fashion retailers have used price markdowns to sell off excess inventories at the end of the season. In the mid-80s, the um, airline executives began to use a set of sophisticated approaches in manipulating demand, call that um, yield management or revenue management. Revenue management has two goals, which is essentially differentiated demand. So in other words, understand your customers and differentiate them. And of course, use the appropriate pricing strategy for each of these segments, customer segments. And then we have some other techniques uh, around pricing where we look at the possibility of doing differential pricing where you price based on your customers or dynamic pricing where you price based on the time. And um, effective use of, uh, of, internet, of the internet as a, an enabler can be used to support e-business, can be used to gather information very quickly and use that information in helping to develop your pricing strategies. All right? And finally, that it, customers must not be seen to be manipulated and unfairly treated uh, through smart pricing strategies.